We have an arrest warrant for Cryptofan. It's been stealing the UV light. Wait, don't arrest it. We need it to see where our protein's coming off the column. So tryptophan is the ninth amino acid or protein letter we're going to talk about, and it's the main protein letter that absorbs UV light. And this is going to allow us to, through a UV light detector, see where our protein is coming off a column when we're purifying it. And we can use um, spectroscopy, so like a nano drop or something like that, to see how pure the protein is, and with the help of Beer's Law, see how concentrated it is, so how much protein we have in a certain amount of liquid. And so there's a lot I could say about tryptophan, like it's used to make uh, serotonin and melatonin and stuff. Um, it gets a bad rap because of the whole turkey myth, which is a myth, more in my post. But today I wanna to focus on the UV stuff. So long story short, the unique part of tryptophan, it's our group or side chain, is this indole group. And it's like these fused rings which have our resonance stabilized. Sons are kind of being shared throughout. And what this is going to do is it's going to lower the cost to excite the electrons. And so when you, you can excite electrons by absorbing light because light is little packets of energy traveling in waves. And so when you just have like single bonds and stuff, it would take a lot, a lot of energy to excite those electrons. So you re need really, really high frequency, short wavelength light. But when you have resonance, you're going to decrease the energy cost needed to get to an excited state. And this is going to bring um, the light needed into a longer wavelength, so a lower frequency light. And this is going to be something that we can detect. And if we know how much we would expect like a given protein to absorb at a certain wavelength, then um, so protein, this absorbs most at 280, then we can use that to calculate how much of the protein there is in there. So tryptophan is one of the three aromatic amino acids. Um, and so these have these resonant stabilized rings. So basically, atoms link up through pair, sharing pairs of electrons, one pair for a single, two pairs for a double. You have a little extra. Um, if all these have like a little extra, they can kind of donate to this, uh, what I like to think of as like an electron commune, um, where the, you have this delocalized extra like electrons, and this is going to hang out like above and below this plane, and we call this resonance um, or electron conjugation. And it's going to have this, it has a lot of effects, but one of the effects it has is going to make it easier to absorb um, light that we can detect. So basically molecules absorb light um, because it can make their electrons get excited. Um, so this is, the electrons are already in the bond. They're not like doing anything that weird funky. They're in a bond, um, but they can still like get excited within, um, within that bond. Um, and when they get excited, they can temporarily jump to like a higher energy state. Um, and then like fall back down. Um, but the diff that they can only jump up to that higher energy state if they have get the perfect amount of energy to do so. So you can't have any more, you can't have any less. You need this perfect amount of energy in order to make that um, jump to the higher energy state. And this energy can come from light, which is these little packets of energy called photons that travel in these waves. And so if a light has a, the, if a light photon has the energy that's perfect for making that jump, then you can get um, light be absorbed. Um, and so the higher the energy of those photons, the shorter the wavelength um, and the higher the frequency. So basically all light has to travel at the speed of light. Um, so if you have something wiggling up and down and up and down with more energy, it's going to like make more up and down. So it's going to be have a higher frequency and it's going to have to be a shorter wavelength in order to not like just like run past all the all the slow guys. Um, and so the difference between these states um, between like the high and the energy high energy and low energy, it's going to depend. So ignore the fluorescence part, but just focus on this. So the difference between the states is going to depend on um, the like molecular and the molecular like configurations and stuff. So what atoms are attached to what, how, um, and long story short, when you have resonance, it's going to decrease the distance between these states. So it's going to decrease the amount of energy that's needed to get to an excited state. And this is going to make it so that we're pushing the energy into a wavelength that we can detect. And so when we're talking about 
protein detection, we're going to be talking about ultraviolet light, which is more energetic, higher energy, um, shorter wavelength than the um, than like visible light, which is the light that we typically think of. So sometimes we have molecules, like if you have really extensive conjugation, like in a dye, um, these can be really close together. Um, and so you don't, you can use longer wavelength of light, like visible light to um, excite these electrons. And then that'll like steal the light. And so you don't see the light. And that's why those things will look colored. When we're talking about proteins absorbing light, we're talking about UV light. So the light that being, that's being stolen is light that we wouldn't see anyway, unless we use a detector. So the things won't, won't look colored, um, but they will be detectable when we use a, a uh, machine like a nano drop or like a spectro um, spectroscopy device, spectrophotometer. I can never remember the terminology. Um, so this is where you just have like a little drop, or you can do it in like a cuvette. Uh, this is actually showing nucleic acids in this picture because we can use it for both nucleic acids and proteins. Um, with proteins, your dominant absorbance is going to be at 280, um, with nucleic acids at 260. Um, and then you also get some absorbance from proteins at 230 from like the protein backbone. Um, and so when we're talking about protein absorbance, our main absorbance is going to come from tryptophan. Um, and so tryptophan, so all three of these are, have this like resonance in these rings, which is going to bring the, um, it's going to bring the distance between those, the like relaxed and excited states of the electrons. It's going to bring that distance um, down to a point where it's in the range of our machines. Um, and so this is going to let us see this. So we, um, but tryptophan, it has the most, it has like the most resonance. So it has, it's going to absorb the strongest. It's kind of like you had even more, you have more places where you can have this molecule like absorb light. And so you'll absorb more light from this. So this can, um, so this is going, um, what we talk about later when we talk about Beer's law, which we can use to convert the absorbance to protein concentration. If your protein has like a lot of tryptophan or a, not very much tryptophan, that can um, that can trip you up. Um, so if you have a, you can imagine if you have a protein that has a lot of tryptophan, and then you see a peak and you're like, wow, I have a ton of protein, but really you don't have that much protein. Your protein just had a lot of tryptophan. Or you might see like a little peak and you'd be like, oh my God, I barely got any protein from that liters and liters of bacteria. And then we'd be like, oh wait, my protein doesn't have much tryptophan. So I actually have a lot more protein than I think. And so when we're using this thing called Beer's Law to convert between the two, we can actually figure out the exact extinction coefficient. Um, so how much yet your specific protein would absorb, like the certain amount of your protein would absorb. And then we could put this into this equation um, in order to determine the concentration. So that is when we use, um, so when we're doing it like this, so you can see that what, what's being absorbed is actually like a spectrum. Um, and so this is showing when you, when you do like a spectrum, spectroscopy and you get like a spectrogram, what's happening here is it's basically testing out, it's scanning a, a like a way, range of wavelengths. And so it's going to tell you the absorbance at every wave. So when this, when the electrons like absorb the light to get excited, you might be wondering, so there's like these absorption maxima, which are like the main places where it absorbs, but there's also like this kind of like fuzziness um, and so this fuzziness is kind of coming from the reason that there's some kind of wiggle room between, there's a couple of reasons. So one is that in different parts of the molecule can absorb light. So you can think about like having your, your, when you have a huge protein, you have like tons and tons of different places where there could be light being absorbed. And so those will all have slightly different like chemical like arrangements and molecular arrangements and different that various thing. So the, the exact perfect amount is going to be like different for different places. Um, and so you can have this kind of, you can have multiple absorbance maxima, um, like we saw with like, you have the aromatic rings and you have the peptide backbone. Um, and then there are other parts of the molecule that can absorb other light. You also have some kind of like wiggle room in the amount. I know I said the perfect amount, but it turns out that there's actually like 
vibrational states um, within like the ground and excited states. Um, there are different like vibrational levels and there are different like states that they could um, like jump to and that sort of thing. So you get a broader peak instead of just like a strict maxima. But by measuring at the strict maxima, that's going to give us the information that we need when we're term determining like concentration. If we know how much it absorbs at that maximum wavelength, then we can convert that to concentration using this thing called Beer's Law length. And so you might be wondering, okay, well, why do I have this? You told me that the protein is going to absorb, the um, these rings are going to absorb at 280. And the backbone, so in the protein backbone, you have the, um, you have resonance in the peptide bond. Um, the peptide bond is resonance stabilized, so you're also going to get some absorbance here. Um, this is going to need higher energy, um, and so it's going to absorb at this shorter wavelength, so 230. Um, so you can see you have like less extensive conjugation and stuff, and you're going to get this absorbance at, you need higher energy to get this to absorb. And so this is going to happen at 2.30. Um, so this is what you're doing, like with a spectrogram, um, you're doing like this range. And this is really useful. So when you're looking at a um, spectrogram, you're seeing something like this, where you have a range of wavelengths. And so you'll see that we're looking at like 220 to 350. And so this is a protein. You can see that it's absorbing at strong, most strongly at like 280. And then you also have this peak at 230, um, corresponding to like the peptide backbone, um, um, as well as um, some other things can absorb there, which is why it's really important that you do a, um, you blank your spectroscoper too, um, your, your um, spectrophotometer, you want to blank it. Um, so do a sample where you like control for your background um, because there are things like salts and um, imidazole and various things that can um, get in, can absorb UV light and then cause problems. So if you do this like wavelength scan, you can see like if you have nucleic acids um, contaminating your protein, um, it's harder to tell if you have protein contaminating your nucleic acid because you can see that pure nucleic acid, it absorbs a lot at 280 as well. Um, and so actually, um, so I purify a protein that binds to RNA and I can actually separate the RNA bound and the non-bound. So you can see when it's bound to RNA. So this is showing you 260 and 280. Um, and so the 260 um, peak is in purple and then this 280 is in blue. And so this is protein alone, you can see. And then this is, so you have some absorbance at 260, but it's a lot lower. And then when you have RNA bound to the protein, you have a higher 260 to 280. Um, and this 260 peak, it, um, but it's also absorbing a lot at 280. So there is a lot more of this protein than this protein, but there's not as much more as it looks like. Um, and so it can be kind of deceptive if you're studying a protein that's binding nucleic acids, you might think you have a ton more protein than you actually have. <laughs> um, and this can also make it difficult to use uh, UV based methods for determining the concentration. But anyway, so this is not a spectrogram. This is a chromatogram. So basically, this is looking at these two wavelengths. This is not scanning wavelengths. This is looking at specific wavelengths. So we're looking at the specific wavelengths where we get the most information about the um, various components that when you're looking at a chromatogram, you're looking instead of your x-axis is going to be like time or volume. And so basically with a chromatogram, your protein is going through like some sort of chromatography column that's going to help purify it. And you want to be able to detect when it's coming off of the column. So when it's coming off the column, it's going to go like through a UV detector on its way to like the, um, sam the sample fraction collector. And so this is going to allow you to then look back at this, your chromatogram and say, oh, okay, so in this fraction, um, so like in this fraction, I want to collect these fractions, which have my protein, these ones I don't care about. But when you're looking at the different peaks here, these are representing like different proteins coming off or different like stuff coming off. They're not representing different wavelengths like we saw before. And so that's why, so don't confuse the two when you're reading them. So we get the most information about proteins at 280 and the most information about nucleic acids at 260. And that's going to be like 
their strongest um, the strongest absorption of them at those. And so that's going to allow us to then um, figure out the concentration if we know how to convert between the or absorbance there and the concentration. So Beer's law or the Beer Lambert law. Um, so it's going to go between the concentration based on how it absorbs light. And so basically you can think about the more your pro so absorbance or um, a, so basically you shine light through a, like a cubette holding your protein um, or through like, a, like a, the column of um, liquid that's formed in the nano drop. Um, and then it's going to say, okay, how much of this light did not make it through? So how much of the light that I put through was absorbed? And so when you're doing this, you're going to be like doing a specific wavelength. So I can shine 280 light through and how much of it is going to get absorbed? So how much of it is going to absorb, get absorbed is going to depend on the extinction coefficient, which is specific for like the molecule you're looking at. So this is, will be like specific for your protein and you can determine it with like software like XPASI Proparam. Pro um, and it's going to depend. So how if it, your molecule absorbs wavelength really light really well, like if your molecule has a high amount of tryptophan, it's going to have a higher extinction coefficient than if your molecule doesn't have much tryptophan, it's not going to absorb light much. Um, and so this is extinction coefficient is going to take this into account. It's also, go, so the absorbance is also going to depend on what we care about, which is the concentration. So like how many molecules are in a given volume um, and then the path length. So this is going to be like determined by the cuvette. Um, thankfully, it's typically like one centimeter. Um, and so you don't have to worry about this. Um, but, but you can think about it like the more the light has to travel through, the more opportunities it has to run into one of these molecules. And if you have a high extinction coefficient, it's more likely to actually like absorb and um, more light um, and that sort of thing. And then if you have more of these molecules, it's more likely to bump into it. And so um, you can then determine the extinction coefficient for your specific protein using a software. There's this great um, software called XPASI Prop Param. Uh, more on this in a different post, um, but basically it'll give you the extinction coefficient and the 280 absorbance value you'd expect if the certain was at a certain concentration. So when I was doing this for bovine serum albumin as an example, um, so the absorbance value is expressed as this like 0.1%, which is the absorbance value corresponding to the protein concentration of one mg per mil. Um, so basically an absorbance of 1% would correspond to 10 mg per mil. Um, and it's actually, so this is going to give you like when you use the software, it's going to give you two sets of extinction coefficients and absorbances, one for under oxidizing conditions. Um, so this is going to say like, assuming all pairs of cis resting residues form cysteine signs. So basically it's a, those cysteines will be cross-linked. You can, and then another one under reducing conditions, which are typical, which is, so this assumes that all the cis residues are reduced. Um, and so you can see that the extinction coefficient under oxidizing conditions is going to be slightly higher. Um, so it's going to be absorbing um, slightly more light um, when it's oxidized. Um, and so tryptophan, it's um, don't let its name, its abbreviation trip you up. Um, so it's one letter abbreviation is a W. Um, so you can remember this by thinking of saying it like Tweety Bird. Um, so twip the fan with the W, um, we have a W. And um, so you can also remember that there's a whole like turkey uh, makes you sleepy myth, um, which is a myth, uh, more on that in my post. But basically, um, but you can remember Tweety Bird, Turkey, uh, Tryptophan uh, myth. Um, but anyway, um, and you can also see if you kind of like ignore the top part, it kind of looks like a W. So, and you can think of Tryptophan, so long, long name, uh, big molecule. Um, so it is a big molecule. It's a very big molecule. Um, so if we look at our size wise, it's the biggest. Um, if we look at hydrophobic, Phobicity, um, we can see it's hydrophobic, um, not as much as phenylalanine though, because we have this nitrogen, 